Well, good evening. It's good to have you with us on this beautiful evening. It's been a beautiful day today. God has graced us with some lovely weather this week. As we gather this day, we have several we want to keep in our prayers. We wish to keep in our prayers, of course, the Fry family as we laid to rest Nancy this day. We also lift up in our prayers Kathy uh, Brighton Camp as she had shoulder uh, replacement surgery done yesterday. We continue to keep in our prayers Ruth Lyons as she prepares for continued uh, treatment for her cancer. We continue to lift up all those who have dealt with COVID over these last few last months and continue to deal with it. And especially this day, we lift up our country and pray for God to bring peace to our country once more. As we gather this day, we gather on the feast day of the commemoration of Johann von Stoppitz. Johann von Stoppitz was the confessor father for Martin Luther. Now, if you don't know what a confessor father is, a confessor father is one who comes to who who you can go to as a pastor or a priest and visit with them and talk with them and openly confess with them and discuss the difficulties that you're having. And you can do so without any f concept of something coming back to you later. I had a confessor father when I was in New Mexico. He was a priest down the road, lived in the rectory down the road at the Catholic Church, and uh, we became very good friends, and we both we served as each other's confessor father. Uh, I haven't found one here in uh, Enid yet, but I'm sure that I will at some point. But it's somebody you can openly visit with. Johann von Stoppitz was Luther's confessor father, and we'll hear more about him in a moment. So as we gather on this day, actually his feast day is October 8th, or November 8th, but we're celebrating it this day, and we do so through the Order of Vespers, as found on page 229 in your hymnals, or you could have printed it off from our website. So let's open this day in our, as we commemorate Johann von Stoppitz, confessor father of our of Martin Luther, who brought to this world a fuller, a better understanding of the grace of God. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Praise to you, O Christ. Alleluia. And together we read Psalm 119, verses 1 through 10, responsively. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. And that brings us to our scripture readings for the evening. And we start with our first reading out of Revelation, the 14th chapter. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is from Second John. Verses 1 through 13. The elder to the elect lady and her children whom I love, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son in truth and love. 
I rejoiced greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. And whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your elect sister greet you. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. And now our gospel reading from the gospel according to St. John, the 8th chapter. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham, and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? And Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. And we read the response read for the day. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your path. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. Unite my heart to fear your name, that I may walk in your truth. Your word is a lamp to my feet, and a light to my path. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning. Your word is a lamp to my feet, and a light to my path. Forgive me for that error there. Now we find ourselves at the time for our message. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. As I said in the opening, today we commemorate Johannes von Stalpitz, Luther's father confessor. Do you remember that dark and stormy night in Luther's life? The date was July 2nd, 1505. Luther was returning to law school in Erfurt from a family gathering at the home in Mansfeld when a terrible storm came up as he was passing through Stoddernheim. And as the story goes, amidst the terrible storm, amidst the horrendous thunder and lightning, Luther climbed down from his wagon, fell to his knees, and prayed to St. Anne, the mother of the Virgin Mary, for his life to be spared. In exchange for his life, Luther swore to pledge allegiance to the Roman Catholic Church and become a monk. And upon morning light, Luther joined St. Augustine's monastery in Erfurt and fulfilled his vow. While at the monastery, Luther was befriended by Johannes von Stalpitz, vicar general of the Augustinian order in Germany. Von Stalpitz had studied at the universities in Leipzig and Cologne as well as served on the faculty in Cologne. And in 1503, he was called by Frederick the Wise to serve as dean of the theological faculty at the University of Wittenberg. It was there that Stalpitz encouraged Luther to obtain a doctorate in theology. It was there that Stalpitz, von Stalpitz appointed Luther to be his successor as professor of Bible. And during this time, Stalpitz, though a devout Roman Catholic, saw some errors in Catholicism and thus contributed somewhat to the Reformation regarding the grace of God and salvation. At one point in a counseling session with Stalpitz, Luther had spent six hours confessing his inadequacy and sinfulness. 
and Staupitz responded to the young man's doubts by counseling him on the means of grace and on salvation through the blood of Christ. Johannes took his time to explain God's grace to Luther. He counseled Luther, surrender to the love of God. He counseled him, you should lose yourself in God. He told Luther he was making religion too difficult. All he needed to do was to love God. But Luther was tormented by fears and doubts. Luther wrote once, I myself, I was myself more than once driven to the very abyss of despair, so that I wished I had never been created. Love God, I hated him. Later, Luther, in speaking of his confessor father, stated, If it had not been for Dr. Stoppitz, I should have sunk in hell. Stoppitz had reminded Luther that Christ died to remit our sins. Focus on Christ, he counseled, and not on yourself. Eventually, Stoppitz was disciplined by the Roman Catholic Church for his supposed liberal views of salvation, salvation by grace alone through faith alone. For Luther, that dark and stormy night had led him to the light. Light with a capital L, the one who declared himself in John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This was the light of truth. This was Christ Jesus, our Lord, who calls us to abide in him, and his words to ab will abide in us, says John. And as his words are the truth, thus do we abide and remain steadfast in the one truth. But what of this truth? It's unconditional love. And hence our text for this evening from St. John in his second letter to the church. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. John, the beloved disciple of Jesus, opens this short letter with the address to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth. So the first question one might need to have answered is a revelation as to who is this lady that John is writing. And if we pause for just a moment to contemplate this, the answer is revealed. The elect lady is the church built upon Peter the rock with Christ Jesus the cornerstone. That elect lady will, on that great and glorious day when Christ comes to call us home, stand before him, the groom, as his bride. The elect lady, the church, and the elect lady's children, the congregation, those who remain steadfast in Christ's word and the truth. But there's another dilemma that comes to us here in these words. What is the truth? This world we are traveling through on our pilgrimage to the promised land is so confused thanks to the false teachers, those who have not remained steadfast in the word, the word of God. Philosophers, those who study philosophy, the nature of reality, say that truth is relative. They say truth differs from each person to each person, that what is truth for one may not be truth for the other. But if this be the case, then unity Unification behind a belief is impossible. Extending from this lack of definite truth, then, the ethics by which we live become relative according to one's own experiences and culture. That word philosophy is derived from two Greek words that together mean love of wisdom. Man seeks to know and understand by his own wisdom. He even tries this with God Almighty, and when God doesn't provide what man seeks, what man believes he needs, then man tends to walk away from God and even questions the existence of God Almighty. Without God, there is no truth. And without truth, there cannot exist unity. And without unity, there cannot exist peace. And hence we hear Pontius Pilate interrogating Jesus. What is truth? <clears throat> Excuse me. What is truth? We know what it is not. It's not that which is determined by the greatest power. It's not what man decides it should be. It's not what promotes one cause, one group over another. 
It's not whatever you want it to be. Truth is not relative. Hence the failure of philosophy, the failure of the love of wisdom. For as St. Paul wrote, the world by wisdom knew not God. What is truth? I am the way and the truth and the life, said Jesus. And through Jesus do we come to the Father, and through Jesus are we led to wisdom, for he is wisdom personified. And therefore, in love of his created, when in the garden Jesus prayed his priestly prayer, did he petition the Father, <coughs> excuse me, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is the truth. This is Christ Jesus the Lord. Second person of the Holy Trinity through whom we can be sure God's judgments are true according to the truth. We can be assured that God's judgments are equitable according to the truth. And this truth, unlike man's ever-changing truth, is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. This truth frees us from the chaotic, ever-deepening darkness of this world and brings us into the light. When we repent of our sinful turning from God Almighty, He receives in His loving, liberating embrace us. Salvation won for us on the cross of crucifixion, upon which Jesus died, was done for so in unconditional love for His created, the crown of His creation. Only through the one truth do we find the freedom to walk away from the lies of this world, the lustful pleasures of this world, the addictions of this world, the bondage to materialism of this world. Only through the love of the Father for the Son, the Son for the created and the Spirit in conjunction with the Father and the Son, are we free to stand steadfast in the world, pardon me, in the Word, steadfast in the truth, when we walk with Christ Jesus, does our life gain true meaning as we proclaim his word, and others join us in the pilgrimage to that holy mountain of Zion? When we stand steadfast in the one truth, loving as Christ loves us, do we receive his abounding grace and mercy and peace? So let us, as with Luther, heed the words of Johannes von Stoppitz, and to remain in Christ Jesus. Election day was yesterday. We don't know which way this country is going to go, how the population is going to react to it. But we do know, what we do know though, is that the truth of Jesus, God's holy word, in that truth we have constancy and the assurance of hope fulfilled. Do not allow this world to draw you into the melee. Stand firm against the deceivers of this world. Know that God loves you and is with you. Know that in Him life is, is eternal. Know that in our abiding in the truth of the Word do we have both the Father and the Son. Know that He will come again, and when He does, then our joy will be complete. And again I beg you, heed the words of Johannes von Stoppitz. Lean on God Almighty, not on your own understanding. Amen. That brings us to our canticle for today. Hymn number 655 from our hymnals. Lord, keep us steadfast in your word. Lord, keep us steadfast in your word. Curb those who by deceit or sword would wrest the kingdom from your son and bring to naught all he has done. Lord Jesus Christ, your power make known, for you are Lord of lords alone. Defend your holy church that we may sing your praise eternally. O comforter of priceless worth, send peace and unity on earth. Support us in our final strife and lead us out of death to life. And that brings us to our prayer. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And we pray the prayer taught by our Savior. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, hear my prayer and let my cry come to you. Almighty and everlasting God, you knit together your faithful people of all times and places into one holy communion, the mystical body of your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant us so to follow your blessed saints in all virtuous and godly living, that together with them we may come to the unspeakable joys you have prepared for those who love you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty, everlasting God, for our many sins we justly deserve eternal condemnation. In your mercy you sent your dear Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who won for us forgiveness of sins and everlasting salvation. Grant us a true confession, so that dead to sin we may hear the sweet words of absolution from our confessor, as Luther heard them from his pastor, Johannes von Stalpitz, and be released from all our sin. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. I hope these words regarding Johannes von Stauffitz as Luther's father confessor, his, uh, his, his pastor, if you would, are comforting to you. I hope they lead you to do as they led Luther, to remain steadfast in the Word of God, because there you will find freedom, and you will find joy even amidst the chaos of this world. May God be with you. Know that God loves you, and so do I. I pray you join us for our study tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock as we can wrap up Second Peter and prepare to move into Jude. Don't forget church on Sunday morning. May God be with you. Amen.